This is the Fresh Start Project, where we explore the growing loss of trust in social institutions and how we can break free from broken systems and move forward towards something better. I'm Christian Mislowick, and with me today is Ann Sussman. Ann is an architect, researcher, and author. Her books include Cognitive Architecture and Urban Experience Plus Design. Her work uses psychology and neuroscience to guide the design of buildings in urban settings that are more humane, beautiful, and desirable, and also explains why we should shun other designs. And welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is such an interesting subject to me. Uh, one of the biggest problems I think with modernity is just how much overwhelming ugliness we live in. And I'm not just talking about derelict factories or graffiti or urban blight like that. It's seemingly just normal environment environments too that are, um, I don't know, they're made out of chintzy or uh, flimsy materials. So it's just offensive to the eye, like lots of vinyl, asphalt, shingles, uh, concrete. Uh, everything just seems uh, unesthetic, very depressing in ways. Uh, fortunately, there's a ton of interest online for traditional urbanism. Uh, lots of aesthetic accounts on Twitter that are dedicated to highlighting more classical architecture, beautiful buildings that we used to build, and more humane principles for designing uh, habitats for, for people to live in. And they these accounts really made a lot of people, including me, aware that there are alternatives to how we live in modern society. So that's why there's a lot of interest, I think. So I'm excited about this conversation. And I guess to start it off, my first question to you is, why does beauty matter when we build? Oh, well, it's about, everything's about connection and everything in life is about relationships. You know, the quality of your relationships um, directs your life and it's personal relationships, but it also relationships with the world around us, right? Um, if you feel happy walking down a street, you'll linger more. You might strike, strike up a conversation with a stranger than if you feel stressed or if you feel too scary or if you feel like, oh my gosh, most streets in Boston, you want to just run right into your car. Um, that's that's the amazing thing. Um, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question there, but <laughs> no, that's you're touching on something really interesting that our environments can affect the way we feel, which in turn affect how we act, how we, re we respond, how we interact with other people. There that was oh, go on. No, go on. No. But that's really the 21st century paradigm shift that we're not as smart as we we think we are. Our non-conscious experience whether we're cold, whether we're hot, whether we're feeling scared, even how we're not even understanding our feelings yet, that's gonna influence what we do consciously. Mm -hmm. You know, and, it's it's really amazing how that happens. And what's terrifying about our society is um, the people who really get evolution are the car companies. Mm, so they, they because they, they have to make sure they're designing things that you're gonna like. They have to understand that um, how fear motivates us. They have to know how much you need to be soothed. So they use eye tracking, facial expression analysis, galvanic skin response. They're really studying your body's physical reaction to their design, to their advertising, to make sure that you're gonna buy their car. Because often the purchase itself is not really logical often, it's biological, it's non-conscious. So the lead designer for the Lincoln car was quoted in 2022, he was quoted as saying, when you get into the car, this is a quote, you will feel like you're hugged by your mother. Mm. And like, what? Well, no, when you study psychology and biology, actually for a mammal, for a primate, that's really important. Feeling that secure, non-consciously, you know you're gonna be cozy in the car. You're not quite sure about the interview coming up, but you know when you sit in the car, you'll be really cozy and they want you to feel that way. So you mm. run into the car, you know. And also, I, I, for car design, I've read that they try to imitate faces. Like, yes, uh, all the time. There was a great like, article in the Wall Street Journal in 2007 that came out about how, quote, cars got angrier and mm. people feeling scared, more scared in their lives or less competent or whatever, and more cars are on the road. There are now 320 million cars in the United States um, that um, people need to feel subliminally, at least, more strong, more they'll be safe. So they'll, they'll end up buying an angrier looking car, mm. you know. And it's non-conscious. That's the big thing that that planners and architects don't know because they don't study. To, I'm a licensed architect. There was zero biology requirement. 
zero psychology requirement, mm -hmm. zero requirement to take any course on evolution, yet you're designing for a primate, right? <laughs> Makes no sense. Whereas car companies or companies like Apple and Apple, they hire PhD neuroscientists and the PhD neuroscientists direct the design of mm, Apple store and, and, and of everything. So for instance, my Apple phone has this little curve here. It's like my finger, it fits in my hand. They study that. They want you to bond to your phone. Um, mm. um, you know, so it's that it's it's the big problem is the car companies and the retailers too are using evolution, the fact we're a hunter-gatherer primate to promote consumption. And the people designing our cities have never taken a bio course. It's crazy. And it's making a less and less um, humane and um, um, sustainable environment. And mm -hmm. what's happening too, what I've really noticed in my lifetime is the really beautiful places where they have walkable streets, where you can easily walk and get coffee and you don't need to drive all the time. The really beautiful places, only the rich can afford to live there now. Yeah. So places like Nantucket, in an island off the coast of Massachusetts, they put down a historic bylaw in 1972, no modern architecture allowed, only traditional cobblestone streets and buildings. Mostly the real estate valuations are so high there now, it may be the highest in the state, and mostly venture capitalists from Wall Street live there. Whereas when I was a kid, my parents could afford to rent, rent there for a month, you know. Sure, because, that used to be so a only, big only, Yeah, it was only the wealthy can afford to walk down a, a, a beautiful cobblestone street with attractive buildings on it. We, we've got this wealth divide where the wealth gets beauty and everybody else gets nothing. It used to be... Um, it used to be a noblesse oblige and, and the wealthy would build beautiful places for the public, but that's not happening anymore. Right. I'm from Connecticut and we have a town, Massachusetts, and in the main downtown area, the main street area, it's all built up by, it used to be built up by the Cheney family. They owned factories where they built silk and fabric and not known at all uh, in America, but in that town, these were a very uh, well-known benefactor family. They built theaters for the locals. If there was a immigrant population, uh, they would build churches for that particular denomination to make them feel welcome. They had that noblesse oblige, I guess you could say. Right, the noblesse for, oblige, right. Yeah, for their workers. Um, uh, obviously, they weren't aristocrats. They were this kind of odd 20th century American um, uh, version of that, but it, it was interesting just how much they invested into beauty and also the type of social spaces in their town. And they're still loved for to this day. Like there's libraries named after them. People refer to the Cheney family, even in modern day. Very interesting situation. Yeah. Yeah. It, made sense. it made, gave a sense of place and community and it showed exactly. how they connected to the community and stuff. Yeah. It makes and, sense. And when you talk about Nantucket, if you could raise the price of real estate so astronomically high that you're pricing out most people just by banning modern architecture, insisting on cobblestone pavement instead of asphalt, then why doesn't some Rust Belt small town make a big investment or get some sort of billionaire patron to try to replicate that magic and uh, raise up the property value through beauty? Well, actually, that's happening in places like uh, the UK. There is a um, a nonprofit a foundation called Create Streets, and they're doing that. Mm, create Streets. Yeah, and they're doing that where they're actually taking um, underprivileged areas, using working with the community, and then using evidence based patterns that are very successful in um, other towns in England, and they're, and they're replicating them. It's it's really beautiful what they're doing, and they're making they're bringing beauty back to design. So people are doing it. In addition, in France, believe it or not, an architect named Leon Creer is working with the Disney Corporation. They have land opposite outside Disneyland Paris, and they're and it used to be old farmland, and they're recreating it to make humane places that aren't car centric, where people want to walk down the street again. Mm -hmm. And they're, so people are doing it, um, but it's not happening the way it needs to be happening. And there's a lot of miseducation of architects. I mean, the fact is, to become a licensed architect. There's no biology or psychology requirement. There's no talk about evidence-based design. 
Um, there's a reason that in Disneyland Paris, as well as Disneyland in California, um, there, when you walk down Disneyland Main Street, it's 52 different face-like, very ornate building elevations. Why? They could have built anything in 1950s. Why did they build that? Because those are the kind of the elevations people are more likely, each one slightly different with slightly different detail, are more likely to walk along. If it were just been blank concrete, nobody would walk down the street. If it had just been all glass, people wouldn't linger around it. So to design Disneyland, Disney sent his Imagineers around the world to really look at where people were happiest. So a word like even happiness um, isn't used in architecture education. Designing for people to be happy, huh? <laughs> Words like beauty aren't used, but for people who wanna monetize it like the Disney Corporation, they use them, they're totally fine with it. And now I've heard it's you, you, you pay $140 to get into Disneyland for a day. The price has just been astronomical, gone up exponentially because it gives people an idea of how they can bring their families to place. They can go often in a very car centric place where they can go without a car and they can actually walk it down where, you know, two or three generations of family can walk down and be together for a day. We haven't designed our cities and towns for that to happen. Right. So you mentioned how Apple, when they when they design a new phone or car companies, when they're designing a new car, they're bringing on um neurologists or, or neuroscientists, people with biological backgrounds, biology backgrounds. So why isn't that happening in real estate or construction? That's a really good question. I think it might be finance. That what's really drives, it, nobody said that. So often they now, things change. You know, we talk about lead and how much energy is going to be consumed in the building and you try to do a green building, but they don't talk about happiness. There's no nothing on a spreadsheet that says, well, people want to linger in front of this building. They don't even look at that. They're mm -hmm. dissociated from that. Um, they're dissociated from the actual human experience. I think for a while people thought it was to, um, you know, it's too personal. You can't get stats, but it's not true. You can get stats on it. You, you, I mean, kidding. the car companies are. Car companies do it. They, uh, if you want to do an ad for a car company, it's not just going to be Christian likes it. They're going to do eye tracking, facial expression analysis of every ad before they put it out to make sure it gets the engagement they want to make sure they get the sales they want. Mm -hmm. They have to do that because the car companies have been, you know, ruthlessly competitive for a century. And this is what they do. And they know the client is very manipulatable and they manipulate them. But the big difference is, the big difference with car company design or Apple design, they know that our unconscious, it's a big different framework. They know the unconscious, non-conscious brain directs experience. Vision happens in two phases. The first one to three seconds is non-conscious. Consciousness doesn't really come in until maybe five seconds after, four or five seconds after. So mm -hmm. you design, the not in the first three to five seconds we look at something exactly the same as a monkey makes sense we share 97 percent of our design with monkeys and it doesn't matter about age gender history doesn't matter so that's why stop signs around the world are red because red is the color that gets us you know that's why churches or temples temples tend to be big with tall spires or they stand or are there on mountains because why because we think uh that that must be important right not consciously the elevation the elevation, the size, um, it, you know, so the non-conscious brain directs us. So they know that they have to know that to be to successfully sell to us. The architects and the planners don't know that. Mm -hmm. So they, and they're, they're kind of working from a false paradigm that the mind is a blank slate. The mind is not a blank slate. Uh, Har uh, Harvard professor Steven Pinker wrote a famous book about that in 2002, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, how 20th century um, humanities are basically in a false premise. Mind is not a blank slate. We're hardwired to want to look for and at certain things. Our brain is subliminally patterned to look at faces. Um, before, by the third trimester in utero, the fetus can recognize an upright from an upside down face mm. and we'll immediately already want to head towards the upright face. It's what we're, because we're a social species, we're designed for interaction. Right. You know, it's, it's it, social species is meant for relationship. The mm -hmm. car companies know that. That's why they said the lead design idea is being hugged by your mother. It makes perfect sense. They get that. Whereas mentioning hugs or love or happiness in architecture is rarely, rarely mentioned. They wouldn't know how to talk about it. Yeah. So tell yeah. me a little bit about your research. I mean, you you have some eye tracking studies behind you. So what have you been doing in this area? 
Well, so we started doing this about seven years ago. We now have a nonprofit called the Human Architecture and Planning Institute, and it's trying to introduce the ideas of, that are being used to promote consumerism very successful, promote consumption very successful to the ideas to planners and architects or people who work in cities that to really design for people, you have to know something about them. And you have to know that their non-conscious brain is directing them. And when you do an eye tracking study, you see that. That um, when you use eye tracking, it, it follows how per, per, per person's eye movements, your eyes move about 45 times in 15 seconds. Who knew? Oh, the business school students know that because they have an eye tracking lab because they're gonna eye track any ad, any website, any package design before they, they bring it out because they have to make sure people look at it the way they want them to look at it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a famous English sentence, um, out of sight, out of mind, but you don't look at it, you're not going to see. So they got to make sure your ad enters the brain the right way. Right. So um, I think that's the amazing thing is what you learn when you played with this. Um, I mean, mostly done pilot studies for about seven years. What you learn pretty quickly is that um, nature's preset what we want to see. Just like it's preset, you have to have water. It's preset, you have to have air. It's preset that you'll probably be walking on two feet. All these things are preset. It's preset what your brain needs to see to feel soothed. You need to see face-like facades. You need you can process bilateral symmetry faster than asymmetry. You're hardwired to look for organized complexity and you're hardwired to take in fractal-like shapes, repeating shapes that um, you know change at different scales, like in a pineapple, it's fractal. You know, right. Find that very beautiful. Or um, like a, a stained glass window in a church. A stained glass window. Yeah, you're hard wild to look at that. Doesn't matter if it's the 21st century or the 19th century. It's exactly the same brain that looks at it. And that's the other thing that the car companies really know that you don't have a modern brain. You have the brain of a hunter gatherer um, that survived on the savanna by picking up things with their hands and feeling they could own it and eat it or mm. take it. So that's why when you walk into an Apple store, what do you see? You see usually eight or 10 iPhones directly on a table that are there for you to pick up and touch. Why? That's the endowment effect. When you, when a hunter gatherer picks something's up, they feel non-consciously it could be theirs. Uh -huh. you see what they're doing? Yeah. They're using hunter gatherer strategy that secured our survival on the Savannah 50,000 years ago to make them a $2 trillion company today, selling the most highest technology. The irony is fantastic. And the table that they'll have the iPhones on will be really, really heavy, maybe a 200 or 300 pound um, you know, oak table. Do you need a 300 pound table for like 10 iPhones? Well, yes, you do, because you wanna make sure that the person feels, it's called the, um, and cognitions embodied you when you see something heavy you subliminally non-consciously feel oh my god it's so important mm. so if those iphones were sitting on a little shelf a glass shelf honestly they could but your brain wouldn't think it's as important for you to look at them you see what they're doing yeah. the same reason queen elizabeth ii sat on a heavy throne there are no pictures of qe2 sitting on a folding stool right no, no picture of her on a on a bench. Well, why? Because it's how you see how they're playing with the brain. Yeah. Well, you're kind of answering a question, not a question, but something I brought up at the beginning of our conversation, how when I see vinyl siding or asphalt shingles, for whatever reason, I, I, I just associate it with cheapness or just slap together. Whereas if I see something like wood or, or a slate shingles, like in the uh, Adriatic, uh, I, I associate that with something valuable, something I want to go to uh, go on vacation. Yeah, well, well, there's definitely a wood bias. We did, it, it, we were, we evolved in the rainforest. Mm. Um, you know why oh, your yeah. hands, go, you know why your hands go like this, right? Why is that? What What do you think this is the shape of? Perhaps a banana, like hunting and gathering. It's a branches? branch. It's, it's a branch. branch. And we can really, and the car companies design the steering wheels for you to grip it really fast, really tight. Why? Because the, the, the animals, our survivors, our monkey ancestors, they they gripped fast to the to branches. If trees didn't have branches, we couldn't have hands like this. Mm -hmm. We're walking around with a phantom branch every day. I see. Get it? Yeah. And now that's, you know, evolution is like, it's like in with the new and keep the old. So that's what happens. And now I'm typing with this on my computer or whatever. 
But so that's it. So we're designed as a primate who we're designed to, to support ourselves, to hold fast to things, because that's how our ancestors survived. The ancestors are monkey ancestors. And that is passed on to us. So now they really spend, a, the car companies spend a lot of time and money on designing the, the feel and the touch of the, um, of the steering wheel of the car. So based on your research, what are some principles that we can apply to building better habitats, better human dwelling places? I understand well, have, the branches, but I don't know like how we can apply the car. Well, well, the number one vision is really important. So basically traditional architecture up until like World War One, mm -hmm. traditional architecture fit what the human brain needs to see. It's why, um, you know, I could go to Italy, not speak any Italian and feel at home in Siena. It made no sense. Made absolutely no sense. It made perfect sense because the architecture is subliminally. Remember, the subliminal brain directs you is feeding me the stimuli I need to feel like I'm I'm in a in a, in a happy place. That's what's yeah. going on. Yeah. So modern architecture does not. Modern architecture came out after the trauma of war, World War One, then World War Two. But certainly there are ideas for it before the war. But it was the war that really made it happen because you had the mass death of the of the arts and crafts class. I think there were 10, 10 million soldiers died. Um, I think maybe 10 million other casualties. Um, and then you have 20 years later, World War II, new technologies, um, this idea to forget the past, like Walter Gropius, the modernist, the founder of the Bauhaus would say, forget the past, start from zero. That was it. But that's not how evolution works. And that's yeah. not how humans work. That's why modern architecture can't create timeless things. We can't forget the past. The past is in us. I'm walking around with a phantom branch every day. You know, I love um, that term. What? I love that term, the phantom branch. The phantom branch. But not only that, every one of your organs, what does it come from? Fish. Where oh. does the pattern for your face come from? Fish. A placoderm fish 250 million years ago. Right. Every one of our organs is first in fish. So, so when you start understanding things like that, um, you start understanding why the car companies don't argue with that. They run with it. Mm -hmm. And then you also understand why the current system is so broken, because it's built on this idea that we can forget the past and start from zero. No, you can't. <laughs> We're in a closed system. But you have to also have a lot of compassion. There's a reason I think people in the 20th century, like my, my family, wanted to forget the past. It was too horrible. So when you study trauma, you read works by Bessel van der Kolk, the book, The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. a survival strategy, PTSD is a survival strategy. People for, to forget the past that allows them to continue living. Without treatment, if they kept thinking about the past, they would collapse. So their body fragments. It's a it's a fracturing that happens to overcome trauma. And so the modern world was really a response to the trauma of two world wars. Is, is that fair to say? Exactly. Yeah. There's this great book by um it's it there's this great book by Margaret Macmillan, a, a retired Oxford University professor, War, How Conflict Shaped Us. Mm. She published it in 2020, the New York Times called it one of the 10 best books of 2020. What she argues in that book is we don't look at how war gave us our world. We're afraid to look at it. And she, what she also argues is that put us in an incredibly dangerous position. And she wrote that book before um Russia invaded Ukraine. Right. What she also says in the book, which is mind blowing, is how the biggest loser of World War One was Russia. Because she says that Germany, France and Russia all lost four million men in World War One. But by 1917, the Russian Empire collapsed. And that and that and then ever since then, they've been trying in one way or another to get it back. Wow. So we haven't dealt with the impact of World War One. Mm. And in um, 2018 or 2017, PBS documentary series did a series on World the Great War it, during its centenary. And what they were saying is, we've forgotten the impact of World War I. And one of the things they concluded was the impact of World War I as contemporary. They said that in 2018, wow. before 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine in February. You know, so we're not dealing with, we don't look at um what war has given us and war gave us nuclear weapons and one of the things margaret mcmillan says we don't look at what that does either and we're seeing now what that does that's giving russia carte blanche to do this war in ukraine we can't seem to stop them so we don't look at how war shaped our, our world and right. and some, some of the ways are fascinating 
So not only did without uh, without war, modern architecture, I don't think could have happened. I think there was a tendency, like people like Adolf Luce said, ornament is a crime. There were all these other tendencies, but modern architecture really happened, I think, because of war. And what happened too, is you learn that the Germans, this is something I read recently, the Germans become experts at ferro-concrete construction. That means building with, they, they built so many bunkers and um, trenches, they had to really learn how to build with concrete fast. Yeah. And that, I think, would end up being formalized with brutalism, making something like Boston City Hall up there <laughs> possible. Again, oh my gosh, yeah. I never made that connection between brutalism. If we, and hadn't, become, if we hadn't become experts at ferro concrete construction, you wouldn't have Boston City Hall. Wow. But I think the other thing that happened, too, was the pivot to car centrism. Yes. But then the car prison, why did that happen? What um, Charles Maroon says in... Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, another book that came out in 2020, I think that was 2020. Mm -hmm. He says that what happened, the pivot to car centrism is a direct result of the end of World War II. World War II ended in 1945 and the car companies were terrified that they would go into the depression that dominated the world, 1929, 1939. 1939, 1945, they were able to pivot out of the depression. Why? Because the government paid them to make tanks and planes and the paraphernalia for war. So what would happen? I mean, all the car went, went they were terrible. So they pivoted to suburbanization, a car in every garage, a completely non-evidence-based, non-sustainable, non-economically viable um, means of construction. There's another, the Charles Marone also founded this nonprofit, the Strong Towns Foundation, Strong Towns, the Strong Towns. And it's all about how just even maintaining the roads for communities is is exhausting. Just right. figuring out how to do that. Yeah. Um, it just, so, it just, just really doesn't work. Now, what but it all, it companies... all is because of war and war thinking, which tends not to be holistic. It's not yeah, it's war got thinking. one purpose. Just right it just got one person. It's linear. It's not, you know, okay, what's going to be happen to the ocean after we drop a bomb on Hiroshima? I mean, they don't talk about, they don't look about, look at it this way. Yeah. So when the car companies were conniving to keep their factories rolling, what exactly are they doing? Are they doing some sort of um, like communications campaign to, to spread this, this meme? I, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert on that. People like Charles Maroon. But you could see there was mass advertising. And even today, I think the major advertisers, I'm not sure if it's the major advertiser, even on the sports channels, are the car companies. Mm -hmm. And they never show you pictures of people um, in, in a traffic jam. Right. They'll, they'll show you pictures of someone driving on a beautiful beach with no cars on it or something, you know. So the way that towns or suburbs are even constructed or designed in modern America, you know, there might be a, for every region, there might be a city and then a suburban area and the sur suburbs are somewhat grid-like. It That's part of this car, co car culture. It's making The suburbs it, are somewhat, what did, I didn't catch what you said. What did you say? My, my glasses. On, on a grid structure. Grid-like. Yeah. Well, right. sometimes the grids sometimes work, like they certainly work in Manhattan and they yeah. certainly work grid like stuff works in Paris too. But I think what's wrong with the suburbs is it's um, things are too isolated. It's not around walking. Um, you know, cars were thought of as progress, but they didn't understand that um, as this Harvard evolutionary biologist, um, Dan Lieberman says, the male body evolved to walk 12 miles a day, the female nine were built for walking. Mm. So so one reason Americans are now 47th in longevity on the World Health Organization charts, we've the lowest longevity of any country that's developed in the world is, is partly in part because we can't walk easily anywhere. Mm. You know, if you're designed for nine, 10 miles a day of walking, we've designed a world where you can't do that. It's so funny how the ripple effect of your living condition affects how long you live, the quality right. of your life, your right. Your your health it's, right, right. It, it makes you wonder just how what the cumulative impact is of living in conditions that aren't conducive to human flourishing right no they're not and they're not it's, sustainable and not sustainable just because of uh right why do you say that because of resource consumption or impact well, on the makes sense. i think our, our our carbon footprint per capita is 30 percent higher in the united states than any country in europe mm-hmm and it just it's just not going to work. It, it 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 they didn't they developed the car centrism without looking at it holistically, but we're in a holistic system, so it's 
they didn't look at the whole full cycle. Yeah. So how could we start, like what would be the optimal human habitat? Let's say I could give you an entire region to design cities, towns, countrysides. What would you do with it? And and you could spend well, I, I think I think if they're doing it already in places like the UK, the Create Streets people have plans to do it. I think Leon Creer's working in France doing it outside Disneyland Paris. You can mm. definitely do it. I mean, you know, um, streets that are charming, people instantly know what they want to walk down. And I think the, there's really urgency here, too, because um, there's a silver tsunami now. Those are the aging baby boomers. There's 70 million of them. I don't think you want 70 million 80-year-olds all driving. No. You know, it's going to be a disaster. And we, we it's going to be a complete disaster. Um, and well, I even think the, the solution they're going to push is self-driving cars. But I don't think that's going to work either, because people actually need to be walking. The more you walk, you'll age better. And even the self-driving cars, I'm not sure that's going to work. Um, it's not going to be quick enough. Uh, the baby boomers are already here aging. And then it, we don't have the, the, the re places for them to live. We need to really rethink how we do things. But in some communities, I mean, the fact is, in places like Copenhagen, more people bike to work than drive. Mm -hmm. And they configured all their their streets and their bike paths so they're connected for bikes and their sidewalks are connected. I live in Concord, Massachusetts, famous for writers like Thoreau, who wrote about walking. He'd be rolling in his grave now. The sidewalks aren't connected here. The uh, the um, there, there are some nice walking paths, but they're not even connected. You know, just, it's it's not connected. It's very car centric, whereas in Europe, you can. I mean, Copenhagen worked for 40 years to make it as safe to bike than as to drive. They made it work and you could make it work. So I think that's the other thing. You need to do evidence-based design, evidence-based planning, and you need to look in Europe and other places that have made it work. And in um, Europe, many of those towns develop, they develop before there were cars, whereas right. so much of the West, maybe less so on the East Coast, there are still some small towns that might have memories of their pre-car history. But I think at almost every developed area of America is based built around that car culture. Well, it was it was running from the past. You have to have compassion for the people who lived through World War One and World War Two. You know, they wanted to run from the past and build a new world. They wanted to make plastics. They were going to take the wheat germ out of bread. You know, they were going to build this new world without realizing that, wait a minute, actually, the human body is built for fiber. It needs the wheat germ. Um, and actually, plastics are not good for the ocean. <laughs> You know, they made plastics without thinking about what the life cycle would be. So it's very, it's it's kind of, it's it, it's not holistic thinking. Right. And a lot of these buildings, we put so much investment into purchasing a house, uh, building up that equity. And a lot of these buildings aren't built to last very long. Um, oh, and that's the amazing thing, too. Like, they're just tearing down a school here that was built 40 years ago. 40 years where, I mean, where there, there's an art center in town, what was it originally? It was originally a school. It's over 100 years old, but it's mm -hmm. well built enough. People want to maintain it. People care about it. Right. But often what they build now, it lasts 20 years, 40 years, then they'll tear it down. And the cost of that is huge. Is it more <laughs> expensive to build to last? Pardon? Is, is it, it more? It doesn't have to be, but you have to understand that you have to understand how traditional architecture feeds the subliminal brain what it needs to see to feel at it feel at its best. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. I think you have to really understand that the mind is not a blank slate, and we are primates, and our animal nature, how our body's feeling without our, ourselves even realizing it, is going to govern our thinking. Right, right. That's what's um, kind of weird. Yeah, I, I was about to say. I know some very basic principles about classical design like a lot of it comes from the pythagorean school or the neoplatonism school uh for example the golden ratio i know that that's a reoccurring motif throughout a lot of our most beloved buildings throughout history but why is that why is it that some geom geometric shapes are more pleasing to the eye than others like what's the magic behind classical architecture it's it's all survival can you go into that? Yes, yeah, survival. Like the building right behind me, and you can see the the old state house in Boston. It suggests a face that's bilateral, so symmetrical. Well, human perception is a um, an evolutionary artifact, right? And there's a survival advantage to be able to 
um, a bilaterally symmetrical shape is faster for you to process, so that has a survival advantage. And also bilateral symmetry is also um, connected with health. If someone has a disease, uh, they, they're, or someone lost an eye, the face loses its symmetry, it loses its beauty, right? So, so beauty and symmetry are often combined. That's what it is. Right. And we need to see organizational complexity. So in a lot of mosques or temples or churches, you see like, oh, columns with, with, with kind of ornamentation around it. Um, and well, why? Because we love, we love pots of flowers. We love bouquets. Mm. Organize the, or, the organization of a flower bouquet makes us happy. Mm. Now, 200 years ago, maybe slightly different bouquet, but not that different. The ornament, we were drawn to ornament, organized complexity, bilateral symmetry. It's kind of preset, face like facade. And our brain can't fixate. If you just make that <laughs> a traditional building all glass, the brain doesn't know where to look. Mm -hmm. So you can't feel like you're in a place. So it won't say it, it will say, uh, uh, don't sit here and have your sandwich. Let's walk somewhere else. Wow. So you can remember your non-conscious brain directs you. It's preset what you need to see. It's yeah. how beauty works. It's why, like, I mean, you know, I think I saw Notre Dame when I was 16 and I walked mm -hmm. in, I was blown away. I'm not 12th century. I'm not from that religion. I didn't speak those languages. Makes no sense. Makes perfect sense because the bilateral symmetry in inside, the way it kind of replicates the old old churches up and replicate old Gothic churches, they kind of seem like you're in a primeval forest. There's a connection. Mm -hmm. not, that, that, those are our roots. We grew up around like tall columns of trees, right? That's and, uh, uh, and, and our evolutionary, our ability to see evolved in nature. That's what we're built to see. So why does that comfort us? Doesn't it put us into a... Scary it's our survival home. mode. It's our it's home. Our home. It's our home. Yeah, it's the our forest home. is our home. Oh yeah, our home. The forest. The forest is our home. And they've even done studies about this. And this is famous studies they did. I think in the seventies, that in hospital rooms, patients that overlooked a natural scene healed faster, had less relapses than patients that overlooked a, br a brick wall. Mm -hmm. It's our natural home. You know, it's people, people even at, at, at a wedding or a funeral, what do they do? They give each other flowers. You know, what, why? It's, it's beauty. We feel we like looking at them and they're fractals. The brain is fractal. That's a repeat, repeating geometric shapes. And, and our, our vision um, can process fractal shapes better than repetitive parallel lines. So often traditional architecture has fractal qualities as well, or fractal patterns on the architecture. And that mm. makes it look at the more and it's easier for us to process repetitive parallel lines they've done studies they know it's very hard for the brain to process them so that's why people tend to avoid looking at them or if you have to look at them you're going to get a headache oh it takes, interesting. you didn't I, evolve them. i, I associate you, parallel lines though with like perhaps the clapboards of that really aesthetic nantucket home yeah but the, but the, they'll be a little bit they'll be a little bit canceling each other out you know what i'm saying they're not perfectly oh, hard see. And they'll have the wooden texture on them and the color, you know, it's not, it, it, you'll probably see it as one, as, as one form rather than individual parallel lines. I see. Interesting. They're, they're called low frequency versus high frequency lines. It's a high frequency lines of modern architecture that stresses the brain, not what we're allowed to see. I see. Interesting. And with the traditional architecture, like the Georgian architecture behind me, there'll often be rounded forms that cancel out the parallel lines. Mm -hmm. So architecture, it's usually, you see this also in, 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 in the Dutch, um, um, the, the, the houses on the canals, there'll be a parallel lines, but then they'll often have an arched doorway or a rounded window, you know, they'll care, it'll cancel, it cancels each other out. Whereas modern buildings are just, you know, like a spreadsheet of parallel lines. There's nothing, there's nothing human about them. Inhuman, right. Interesting. So the Boston State House, that's a Georgian, that's Georgian ar architecture. Yes. Okay, right. And then after the Revolutionary War, America embraced the, the Federalist or Adams style? Yeah, I'm not really up on that, but I think that might have happened as well. Yeah, you're right. Okay. I think those are still pretty, take a lot of cues from the classical, but yeah. But so the post-war is really when we get the modernism. Um, I don't think it could have been happened. Modernism couldn't have happened without the war. Yeah. And the it's Bauhaus war. movement, Bauhaus? The Bauhaus came directly from the war. Because okay. he was a Bauhaus. He spent four years in a in a trench. I didn't know that. 
you want me to share my screen? Yeah, let's see it. Okay, can you see this? I can. Okay, so it's just the idea of the paradigm shift. It's all about, we're in a new age of biology. This is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, the OECD, based in Paris, Age of Engineering. And this is where we are now. We can understand exactly how humans function. And, and so you can do, this is the kind of eye tracking you can do. You can take something really famous and you can see exactly how she's looking at Villa Rotunda. This is the building by Palladio in Italy. And it ended up being, uh, George Washington hired an architect that did a different a building like this. And it ended up being the design for the White House. And now the version of this is on every $20 bill. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, pretty crazy, huh? Now, what and, does that actually tell us? Like, what, how is so the order? That showing you, so, so this is what, if you went to business school in mm -hmm. the United States, you'd use this technology. The circles are the fixations where your eye without your conscious awareness is making you go. The oh, lines, the cards. See how powerful it is? So I can yeah. tell what your brain is gonna act on. Got it? And so what they do is they they go with stats. TTFF is time to first fixation. They wanna know where you will look first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And this was in 15 seconds, how people looked at it and how similar it is. What's fantastic is you realize, oh my God, um, if Palladio hadn't designed this building with that, that many statues on it, it couldn't have been as famous because that's where people immediately look. Oh, I if see. Statues, get it, see? Isn't that amazing? So and people's eye normally go in a pattern instead of actually just looking at things that disrupt the the surface of the image. Well, they, well, people are hardwired. We're a social species, and remember, we evolved without buildings. We're hardwired for survival in the savanna. Most important thing on the savanna to see was what other people. Yeah. And that so even if you put them on top of a. Um, if even if you put them on top of a um, roof, that's where you'll look. That's what you could see. So this is the setup. This is the same. I'm using the exact same software as Honda, BMW, and GM. So they're designing. And so what they also will measure is your brain waves, your facial expressions, your eye tracking, your heart rate, your sweat glands, because they understand the science that the planners don't know, or the architects don't know that the non-conscious experience directs your thinking. If it hadn't worked that way, we couldn't have survived. Okay, it's basically what Freud also said, the mind's an iceberg. What Freud saw, Freud died before this technology came online, but what he saw interviewing hundreds of clients is that their non-conscious was directing their behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what's so interesting is how the tech people know, know this. 95% of brain activity is beyond our conscious awareness. And this is from a website service, get it? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. So that's the basic idea here is that the humans are, we're not as smart as we think, right? This, this, she's, this woman did a TED talk that's been viewed 25 million times. Many of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel biologically, we're feeling creatures that think. That's, the paradigm, shift. that's the paradigm shift. That's why the car company guy said, I want to design the new Lincoln like you're being hugged by your mother. Right. But, and when you go to the supermarket now, this was like a year ago on the supermarket shelf, the science of emotions. Whereas emotions were never taught, taught right? So that's a basic idea here. Uh, but this is amazing to me, the business schools. This is Harvard Business School. They now have a whole series. You go to Harvard Business School, you're going to study emotional intelligence. You'll use words like empathy. And they learn that bosses that are more empathetic make more money. Really? Isn't that, Isn't that amazing? And these, are, these books are amazing. I, I highly recommend them. Happiness. None of these words were ever used. Um, okay. In the business world. In the business world, but they're used in the business world. None of them were ever used in architecture school. Oh, I see. So this is all the business world. So this is just, this just shows how people look at things. Oh, hold on. Someone just talked to me briefly. Okay. Uh, uh, hold on a sec. Um, Okay. All right. So basically, this just what's so powerful about this technology. There's a reason Honda, BMW, GM, Tesla. They do not screw around. So you can actually when you make anything like this is a library in New York City that was recently renovated. What you can yeah. do is you can um, when you Photoshop out the windows, the brain again the unconscious directs you. The brain does not let you look at the building the same way. It's the exact same building. Your brain won't let you that, that see it the same way. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 
it's incredible. Now, was there some other way aside from this uh, eye scan to determine his reaction, his emotional reaction to what he was seeing? What? So is there some other way? Yeah, aside? yeah. Then you can measure. You can measure all these other things too. I mean, you can measure everything. If you have a lot of money, you measure all, all of it. Okay. But so you understand. You understand their. You get data on their site, their physiological state that they don't even know they have. Now, did this girl respond positively to the library with the windows? More no, so we, than the we guy? didn't. We didn't ask her that question. We just asked her the. We didn't ask that question. We just okay. want to know how they responded differently. And then when you show people, where would you rather wait while well, I park the car? You're going to wait with the books. Do you want to wait on the left or the one on the right? Where, which building do you want to wait in front of while well, I go park a car? They're both libraries. One on the left or the one on the right? Well, I would say right. Yeah, 700 people have said right. Okay. But you don't know why you said that. I know why you said that. I can make a theory of why you said that. Because subliminally, non-consciously, your brain could make the fixation points that makes you feel more secure. Remember, we evolved in the savanna, which was a highly dynamic place, and that's the brain we still have of an African primate in the savanna. That's what we are. And so what they get is they also get big data on it. So they go TTFF is time to first fixation. How, when it doesn't have windows, you see the brain slightly quicker, but by 12 seconds, you're already looking beyond the building. When it has windows, your brain doesn't let you look. If you look beyond the building at 10 seconds, then you look back by 13 seconds, you're looking back at the building. See mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So that's yep. probably why you wanted to stay in that building. So Got now I can, I can, you know, it gets crazy. You can figure out everything. So you can even do this one, which is preferable here. They're both the same. One has print on it, one doesn't. Mm -hmm. You can see when it has the print, the brain doesn't let you look down the street. You spend more time on it. You spend more time, you don't look on, isn't that amazing? It can totally change. How you, and then, but then this is where it gets sick. Now you can measure also how many times people smiled. So in this the, case, the heat maps people, are when you smile. Yeah, it, the, um, what? Uh, what it, how do you it, tell when somebody smiled? What happens is the, the red dots are showing the aggregated view, vision of all the people. It's aggregating all their vision. And, the, and then the, um, the, the blue here is showing how many people smiled how many times. Oh, wow. So basically only four people smiled. The most was four people in uh, 14 seconds smiled when they saw this, whereas look at this. So here, five people smiled three times. The bar charts show how many people smile and they track it. So this is the kind of technology that Honda, BMW, GM and Tesla are using. So they didn't even remember they smiled, but I know because I tracked it. Okay, because what happens, you can track it when you look at things. Um, you can track it with the little, there'll be a little TV camera, a little camera up top, sure. top of the monitor that's tracking your facial expression. Get it? It's pretty yep. sick, guys. It's pretty sick. <laughs> so basically- you can track everything. So here's a new building, but the people designing this had never done any biometrics. This is a new library, public work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, public funds, right? But it's designed in a way that people won't look at it. They look at the girl in the sexy yoga pose and the app. Right. They, don't, they completely ignore the building because the brain can't focus on glass. We didn't evolve with glass. Sure. So it shows that, it, and there's so much going on on the street so many people to look at. That's where people are looking. That took people 14 seconds before they saw the red light. Probably mm -hmm. high high traffic incident place. Here's a famous building in Boston. And um, the building changed hands about eight years ago. And then the new owners are very smart real estate developers. They put a picture of a guy uh, floating on a barge in France on the building on the side that faces the highway coming into Boston. And that's where people are going to look. So 50,000 people driving into Boston today, every day, non-consciously will look there without even realizing it. It was so successful, they kept it up longer than they thought they would. Whereas normal okay. black facade, you can't look at. So mm -hmm. what you can really see is when you do these studies, you see pretty quickly that people are hardwired to see people. That's what we're built to see. And this is the neuroscience behind it. Human brain devotes more area to face recognition than recognition or anything else. So this, this is a book by a neuroscientist. And he wants to sell a book, so he's walking the talk. What does he put on the book? Face. Got it? Yeah. See, you That's get it? Smart. 
And so then this is why, so the pattern for the face is already in your brain by the third trimester, the template for a face. And so that's what's going on there. And the guys at Amazon, they track what you click on. Number one thing people click on is a book with a human face. So I said to my first book, I said, you got to have the face on it. So they put this face on it from the book. And then I eye tracked it afterwards. That's where people look. Mm -hmm. so second edition, we kept the face right there. Oh, wow. And so Amazon, why does it look like a face? Because the number one thing people click on is a face. That's why. Get That's it? That's why that little arrow is there. It's a smile. It's a smile. It's exactly right. Wow. The neuroscience of that is that there's something called face patches in the back of your brain that non-consciously, without conscious awareness or control, blood immediately goes to that area from the smile, and you're going to suddenly feel happier seeing a smile. And so that's why, look at this, big num business. Whether you're saying oatmeal, whether you're selling clothes, whether you're selling software, it's always the same. Business guys have to know. Yeah. So the, the Gerber baby was a real person. It turns out the Quaker Oats guy, they completely made it up. Okay. <laughs> Didn't matter. Microsoft is made up too. Okay. And so in 2018, I did a study where I asked people, I asked 500 people at 19 different talks before I gave my talk, draw a house like you're a five-year-old and then tell me where you were born. And look, it didn't matter. They all drew the same thing. Yeah. Why are they drawing the same thing? They're drawing the same thing because it's, um, they're drawing this. Right. That's it's already in their brain. And so I, it was fascinating watching them. They didn't, they didn't realize what, they, what they're built to see. But yeah. so what's fascinating is, yeah, this is what this is an article by a robot developer. Perception of face-like patterns. See, but the problem is the neuroscience, the, the architects and planners don't know this. And th the this is a church, this is a church in Salamanca, Spain. It's World Heritage Site now, built 500 years ago. People were illiterate. It makes sense once you understand that you understand why traditional architecture has so many faces on it. It's what we need to see to feel part of a place. And this is an Apple store five years ago. Exactly the same. A lot of faces. Exactly the same. So the way it works is when you see a face looking at you, it releases oxytocin, the hugging hormones, and you're more likely to walk towards the person. So that's what they're doing. This is an Apple store four years later. Exactly. That's a very upbeat assessment because when we were evolving on the savannah, another human could be a friend or- oh, but, the, but the way it works though, it's the way it works is that um, face to face interactions regulate state. Okay. So the quality of your there's a Harvard study called the Harvard Longevity Study. They 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 you can Google it. It they started asking their graduates from the class of 1930s till today what mattered in their lives at the end of their lives. And the end of the day, it was all relationships. Mm -hmm. It wasn't money. It wasn't books she wrote. It was relationships. So that's it. So the way we're built is for, you know, the boyfriend to smile at the girl, the dog to touch your nose. This is how primates are built. Wow. And so that's why this looks like this. That's why this they did this. They don't realize the science, but that's the science. And this is what a psychologist says. You can take the person out of the Stone Age, but you can't take the Stone Age out of the person. That's amazing. Do you so think the classical architects understood that they were replicating faces and they're they making probably, I don't, Well, I don't know because the word facade means face. Oh. And and this is like one of the most photographed buildings in, in Harvard Square. Yeah. Lampoon building built in like 1906. And um, all, all the Asian tourists come and take selfies with it. And then this but, is what happened to Frank Gehry's building. It didn't have a face in Bilbao. So what happened is the museum directors made Jeff Koons puppy sculpture <laughs> with this changing um, greenery. They made it they made it permanent outside the front door. Mm. Can't give it identity. And this is a Maya Lin building also in Harvard Square. Because it doesn't have any identity, what happens is they had to put big faces. To, right. and so you walk in the cafe there, a big face. <laughs> it's the same thing. 
So this is the deal with modern architecture. It becomes blank and dissociated, and it's directly connected to the fact the founders were war vets. Mies van der Welt and Gropius. Le Corbusier was too blind. So World War I, in fact, is contemporary. This is John Singer Sargent. The, mm -hmm. British, the British paid him when he was 62 years old to sketch UK and American soldiers fighting in World War I at the Western Front. Can you imagine? Yeah. And he went to his studio in 1919 and did this. Tanks were invented in World War I. But so this is what's happened with 21st century paradigm shift. Now we know what PTSD does to the brain. It wasn't even a term till 1980. It changes how you see. So this is the big idea here is that what we express externally reflects our internal brain architecture, the structure of our hidden internal world. Reality is a construct between eye and brain. The way we build reflects our internal brain design. So this house here, you know, the, or, or the little carriage house reflects the brain's bias to need to see people, right? Um, whereas Gropius's house, this is his house about six miles from where I'm sitting right now, looks like a bunker. Yep. If you have PTSD, what happens is your brain shrinks, you lose the ability to take in detail, and your brain stays in a fearful state. So that's what happens. The dissociation that is a hallmark of all modern places directly relates to dissociation of World War I vets. So was he subconsciously trying to create a, a home that he felt was more defensive? It, it would be <laughs> some, it, that's exactly it. I showed this to a Harvard um, medical school uh, teacher, and he explained to me that it's it's a house built for safety. It's it's classic PTSD. Your non-conscious fear state. Remember, people when they drew those houses here, they didn't realize that their non-conscious was directing them. Mm. Gropius didn't realize that his non-conscious was directing him. Right. Neuroscience so like, didn't know that then. We know that now. So he's what happens in trauma is the brain keeps trying to replay the trauma as you try to heal from it. So this is the house across the street, <laughs> which is more inviting. Nicer. Yeah, which is more inviting and welcoming. You know where the door is. This is his house, right? So yeah. that's what it is. With PTSD, you become disembodied. You can't connect because if you connect with yourself, you collapse, right? Yeah. So this is the amazing thing. The section of a World War I trench, the section of his study, exactly the same. And this is where it gets more mind blowing. He, he had to be aware somehow of the similarities. No, 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 no. You, you split. My dad had PTSD. You split. That's not how PTSD works. You cut off. If you were part of a group of guys and 125 of the 250 died in six months, do you want to remember that? No. If your captain was shot and shot in the face in front of that front of you, do you want to remember that? Nope. That's what happened to Gropius. Yeah. Um, how, how about if your husband's forehead was shot off and landed in your lap, like happened with Jackie Kennedy? Yeah. No. She never got treatment for PTSD. She was a hidden smoker, and she died at 64. You know, I mean, you know, you're going to go through incredible shock. Your husband's forehead lands in your lap. And they, they didn't, PTSD it didn't become a word till 1980. You know, Kennedy was shot in 63. They didn't know, right? So, so this is even more mind blowing. This is his bedroom. So the men slept in, 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 in dugouts. That's a quarter, hidden corridors, yeah. hidden, hidden sturdy doorway. So Gropius made the same layout and put his bed behind a doorway. <laughs> yeah, so uncanny. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I've given you a lot. Um, so this is it, a direct expression of modern architecture is a direct expression of trauma of World War I trench. Um, this is on my website, um, ansussman.com. And basically I presented at a medical conference. I got zero pushback. <laughs> and, and, and the quote you say they now know was on the autism spectrum. And so someone in my family is autistic. So this is how they looked at a cat. This is how a neurotypical person looks at a cat. Okay. Okay. So they're not looking at the face. Exactly. Yeah. And so the neurotypical looks directly for things, for the detail. The autistic person goes right at the blankness. So that's why Kurbu's building look like this. Get it? It's almost like an inversion of what the neurotypical. Exactly. It is exactly in. right. That's exactly right. Okay. You had to have autism or PTSD to design like this. 
I see. PTSD people are also face averse. Why? Because they're because because exactly like you said, someone could be coming up to you to kill you. Mm -hmm. PTSD they for for treating PTSD they do eye track them, and the more they heal, the more they'll be able to look at eyes. So modern architecture here, here there's an article on this. The mental disorders gave us modern architecture. Mm. People with atypical fixations came up with the approach a bit of a wounded world that wanted to bury the past. Gropius would say to his students at Harvard, start from zero, forget the past. Well, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. we actually need to see buildings that look like faces because that's what a social species need to see. Trauma gave us modern architecture. Without World War I, it couldn't have happened. Okay. So I can understand why that generation of traumatized architects would build like this, but what's the excuse the modern architects have? Well, because that's what they learned. They learned the path, they were given the path because remember our, our, our grandparents and our great grandparents lived through trauma. They didn't want to talk about it. They gave us the, oh, we're going to do plastics, take the wheat germ out of bread, tell women not to breastfeed, you know, drive cars with lead in them without, you know, it was all about that. Right. So with the first century paradigm shift, we can see what we're built to see and need to see the social species. These buildings are mostly tr protected by historic bylaws in greater Boston. You can't take them down. Why? They create a sense of place. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And here's the last thing I'll say. When you know the mechanism, you can use that understanding to drastically improve the human condition. That is how you spark a revolution. You shift the frame, you change the lens, and all at once the world is real. Nothing is the same. Awesome. I think that's a great place to end. But Anne, I know we could probably go on much longer. So we'll anyway, I guess that it was pretty quick, but it, it's a lot there to get out, but the science needs to get out there. And I don't think most architects know it yet, but we can't just have the car designers knowing it. No, we got to spread the word. Well, Anne, thank you so much. And for those of you watching, uh, if you like this video, give it a like and share, and we'll talk <laughs> to you next time. Take care.